Good morning. Take your hymnals, please. Turn to page number 348. 348. Stand with us. And let's sing My Savior's Love, page 348. And sing that first verse with me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me for me it was in the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own grace but sweat drops of blood for mine how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see, twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me amen and thank you please be seated <coughs> and listen as the choir sings there is a redeemer
Amen. Thank you so much, choir. Turn to page 343. 343, stand with us. Great old song, Amazing Grace. Page number 343. Now please stand with us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. did that grace appear the hour I first believed and as Julie plays through that a few times get around shake hands with your neighbor and tell him you're glad to see him this morning and sing that third verse with me last verse with me. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we Thank you. Please be seated. And right now we have John to come and sing for us. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died. To buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, and then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's fight, no war with pain. And then at 
as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives because he lives we can face tomorrow because he lives our fear is gone because I know he holds my future and life is worth the living just because he lives Amen. Great job. Great song. Appreciate that. Welcome to Pioneer Baptist Church. Good to see everybody here this morning. We're missing a few folks. We've got a little late summer surge and vacation. Uh, that's where mom and dad are. They're out of town, so good for them to be able to get away. They each survived the plane trip, so that's good to know, and uh, they're spending some time back east, so we expect, uh, expect them to be back in another week or so. We appreciate those that are filling in while they're away, and once again, great to see you all here today. We have no coming events for the month of August. I will take this time to ask if we have any first-time visitors here. Anybody first time in our services? Enoch is pointing. That means Enoch has to talk. Future nephew-in-law. You say Marco? All right, great to meet you, Marco. Thank you for being here today. All right, I'm going to look down here. We've got a few birthdays. Adrian's birthday this week. Happy birthday to Adrian. Henrietta's got a birthday this week. Don't see Henrietta yet. Mary Martellano. What? Working this morning. All right, we'll try to catch her next time we see her. Steve Hernandez, don't see you today. Joshua. Joshua. There's Josh. How old's Joshua now? 17. Goodness. Byron and Ashley have got an anniversary today. Don't see them this morning. We'll catch them next time as well. Richard and Rita. Happy anniversary to Richard and Rita. How many years? 26. Congratulations. Any other birthdays or anniversaries this morning? All right, sir. Let's sing happy anniversary first. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. And now, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, well, gentlemen, if you will, we'll take this morning's Sunday morning offering. Track of the week, the way to heaven. 
Got a good quote in here, of course, from John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Got some good lines in there. Doesn't matter if you believe in something else sincerely and earnestly enough. Not going to get you there. One way to heaven. Pick that track up. Share that with people on your ways. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for meeting with us this morning. Thank you, God, that uh, some were able to get away uh, on a vacation. Give them a good time of rest and relaxation. We pray that you would bring them home safely. Give them traveling mercies. And Lord, for those of us that are here today, we look forward to what you have in store for us. We pray that you would bless the preaching, the singing that's still to come. And God, as we give this offering back to you, we ask you would take it, bless it, multiply it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your hymnals one last time, please, page 349. Stand with us. Oh, how he loves you and me. Page 349, and please stand. Oh, how he loves you and me. Kids, you're dismissed. Sing that last. Jesus to Calvary did go. His love for sinners to show. What he did there brought hope from despair. Oh, how he loves you, oh, how he loves me, oh, how he loves you and me. Amen, and thank you. Please be seated. And right now we have Jan to come and sing for us. my Lord suffered for me, carried the cross all the way, my sins to atone. Then they nailed him to that cross, great was the pain and the loss, he suffered it all because he loved me. He loved me, my Savior died On the cross was crucified No greater love for mortal man Has 
has ever been known. All oh, praises your name, he loved me so. Now I'm in his arms, mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. him in a lowly grave surely they thought that this would be the end of this man but on that third and glorious day God came and rolled the stone away he rose from the dead because he loved me because he loved me, my Savior died On the cross was crucified No greater love for mortal man Has ever been known Oh, praise his dear name, he loved me so Now I am his, he's mine, I know He suffered it all because he loved me because he loved me my savior died on the cross was crucified no greater love for mortal man has ever been known all oh, praise is your name he loved me so now i am his he's mine i know suffered it all because he loved me all oh, praise his dear name he loved me so now i am his he's mine i know he suffered it all because he loved me because he loved me because he loved me Amen. Good morning. Well, uh, pastor's going, obviously he's not here today, and he, uh, every time he goes on vacation, I fear he's going to tell me, why don't you preach for me Sunday morning? Um, and I still have that fear after many years, and, but it's a privilege for me. And uh, with God, you know, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So I'm going to open our Bibles here tonight, or today. It's not even night yet. This morning, I want to have our Bibles open to uh, the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Chapter 8, beginning on verse 18. And by the way, I am uh, so happy to see uh, uh, Marco here tonight, today. And I, I, we, just, we just joke around uh, and have fun sometimes. And Marco is my, uh, I, I, made him, I said, niece or nephew-in-law should be cousin-in-law. All right. So make sure uh, everybody understands that. I'm that not old. I'm not that old. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here. And Lord, would you please make my voice uh, clear and make me a uh, a vessel for you to speak to our hearts tonight, today. 
thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you, Lord, that the Lord Jesus Christ loved me so much as the song goes. Uh, he suffered and died. He rose again from the dead because he loves me. Thank you so much for that. And would you lead, guide, and direct now? I, I pray that your name would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to talk about today, this morning, the problem of pain. The problem of pain. If, you have, if you're taking notes, that's my title for today. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Now, everybody knows pain. There's no, 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 I don't know of anybody who never felt any pain in this life. There, there might be physical pain, might be uh, emotional pain, might be spiritual pain. Some because of our own choosing, as a result of our decisions. And what most uh, I've heard is some because of somebody else's cho uh, choosing. And uh, we... We, 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 we've heard of wars, we've heard of uh, uh, pestilence, we have, uh, we have heard of uh, starvation, disease, natural disasters, calamities. And uh, recently we are uh, confronted with uh, two shootings here in the States, two mass murders, and that causes pain. The Bible says in Romans 8.18, if you have your Bibles, the Bible says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time... Stop there. There is suffering in this present time. Pain and suffering is for sure. Problems are real. Pain is for real. If we don't have any answers for suffering, then we can become discouraged. People get discouraged and pain and suffering comes to their lives and they were discouraged. And some of them, they, they become rebellious when pain and suffering comes to their lives. Asking God, God, why did you le let this happen to me? Why do I suffer as I do? Or why did my loved ones suffer? And sometimes those pain and suffering can bring about doubt. That's why some atheists and agnostics devise a false syllogism or false reasoning that pain exists because one of these three things are correct about God. They say, number one, that God has no power over pain. God has no power over suffering. Therefore, he is not all-powerful. All he is impotent, they say. He is weak. Secondly, the atheists, and the people who don't want to believe in God, they say that God maybe is all-powerful, just as you said, but does not care enough to stop it. He is uncaring, they say, and just sits there in heaven and doesn't care. Or, they say, there's pain and suffering in this world because God does not exist. And that's how they reason things as they th th think about God. But that was not the Apostle's Paul, Apostle Paul's problem. In Romans 8 verse 18, re let's read it again. For I reckon. The word reckon means it's just sort of bookkeeping or, or trying to figure out something. I figured out. I calculated. I therefore conclude. There's so much suffering in this word. And he said, I reckon. Now I know. I understand. I calculated. Paul was doing some figuring and he said, he reckoned that yesterday's curse brings bondage. Look at Romans, uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 20 to 21. Romans chapter 8, verse 20 to 21. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. He reckoned that yesterday's curse brings bondage. There is a bondage today that causes pain and suffering. Look again in verse 20, for the creature itself was, for the creature was made subject to vanity. What's vanity? Vanity means to lack in use. My pastor has a friend, dictionary.com. He's not my friend, but I have Merriam and Webster.com. It's a noun, something that is vain, empty, or valueless. I don't know about you, but when something is vain, empty or valueless, it's good for nothing. There's no use for it but to throw it away. I have a lot of those in the garage. But Paul reckoned that all of creation is in bondage. Understand, before we go uh, continue, understand that God did not create a corrupt or sinful world. Let me show you briefly in Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to read it to you, but if you want to uh, open your Bibles there, uh, you're welcome to do that, but I have it here. He created light in Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. And God saw the light, and it was good. He said it was good. And then in, in verse 10, He created the earth and the seas in, in the day, day 2, the second day. And God called the dry land earth. The gathering together of the waters called he sees, and God saw it, that it was good. And then in the thir uh, third day, he created vegetation. Genesis 1.12, And the earth uh, brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, tree yielding fruit, and God saw that it was good. And then the fourth day, the sun, the moon, the stars, Genesis 1.18, and he said, it was good. The next day he created the fish, the birds from the waters. In Genesis 1 verse 21, and God created great whales and all those things. And he said, it was good. On the sixth day, he created land animals. And then the crowning glory of his creation, he created man on that sixth day. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. And all those things, and God saw that it was good. Then after he created man and putting him in charge of the creation on the sixth day, he stepped back and looked at the totality of all his creation. And he said, if, you, if you're there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, look, behold, it was very Good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Make no mistake, it, mistake about it, my friend. God is not the author of sin. God is not the author of decay. God is not the author of corruption. He's not the author of evil, suffering, and pain. God created man perfect. And God gave man a gift. God gave man the gift of choice. God created man perfect and perfectly free. He created man with the freedom to choose. God did not create a pre-programmed robot. He created man with the ability to choose the freedom to love him back. Can you imagine if Adam was created only with one choice, and that is to love God, would you like that with your wife? I, I want a wife that will love me all the time, will not hate me, will not argue with me. Can you imagine that? Although that's a good idea sometimes, but, <laughs> but you don't want that, right? And I will, I will uh, talk about that a little bit more. Just imagine... Don't ever forget that, my friend, because people come up with false reasonings or syllogisms all the time. And one of them is this. 
You have to bear with me. Follow me along, please. I wish I could speak more clearly. But God, this is their argument. God created all things. Evil is something. Therefore, God created evil. That reasoning in and of itself is evil. Look again. People come up with this reasoning. God created all things. Evil is, is something. Therefore, God created evil. And so we have a problem. They say. But that is not the way the syllogism works. That is not the argument. Now, let me tell you the argument. Here's the argument. This is a very important part of the, uh, the message this morning. Very important. Listen and follow along closely, please. Here's the argument. God made everything. God made it perfect. It was good. It was very good. When God finished, he rested. That means he stopped creating. And God said it was very good. He made man. He made man perfect. He, man, he made man perfectly free. That is, he gave man a choice. Why did God give man a choice? Because God wanted something uh, from man that is unique, special, wonderful, and glorious. He wants, he wants man's love. God wants you to love him. And that is the highest good. To love God and love one another. Why? For God is what? Love. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not, loveth not God. For God is love. That's the highest good. Why didn't God just force us to love him? Why? Think about that. Would you want your son or daughter or your wife to, force, to be forced to love you? I can't even love myself. Why didn't God just force us to love him? Forced love is a contradiction in terms. There is no such thing as forced love. Love has to choose. Now in order for the lover to choose to love, he has to be able to choose not to love. Are you with me? Or else, it is forced love and it is not love at all. So what is the highest good? The highest good is love. Man therefore must be perfectly free to choose to love God. In order to have the ability to choose to love God, man must have the ability to choose not to love God. Or he would not have any choice at all. And not to love God is evil. The greatest commandment is to love God with all your being, so therefore the greatest sin would, not, would be not to love God. Now Adam and Eve chose to sin because... They were perfect and perfectly free to choose. And when they did, this whole world came under the bondage of corruption. We live in a sin-sick world and we are a part of it. Why didn't God just step in and stop Adam and Eve from sinning and destroy the devil? Let me tell you something. It would not be good for God to step in and destroy evil. Why is that? If God would have stepped in and destroy evil, God will be destroying what? Freedom. If God would have stepped in to destroy evil at that time, that God will be destroying evil or freedom. If God would destroy freedom, God will destroy the opportunity to love. Are you with me? If God destroyed the opportunity to love, God would destroy the highest good. So God did not destroy evil. 
But there's a key point here I want to make. God defeats evil. There's a big difference. The second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this earth to undo what the first Adam did. And on the cross, he defeats evil with his death, with his burial, and his resurrection. Now, what is the bondage of corruption we read about in verses 21 to 22? Romans 8, 21 says, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. If you think about it, all creation fell with Adam and Eve. They dragged the entire creation down with him. And as a result, there was a curse. And that is where pain and suffering came to be. We are cursed with a curse. The infection of sin went into the earth and then corrupted everything. So God is not the author of evil or, 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 or uh, he is not the author of, a, of a sin. He's not the author of pain and suffering. It's a direct result of the choice of two perfect human beings who perfectly have the right to choose and chose not to love God. There was a curse as a result of that. There was a, a curse on the animal kingdom. God did everything, was very good. And then in Genesis 3.14, as a direct result of the curse, there was a curse on the animal kingdom. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Every animal in this world was cursed, but the serpent was cursed above all cattle. Everything, above everything. And above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go. The serpent was cursed above all the others. Then there's a curse on the mineral kingdom. Verse 17, uh, again in Genesis chapter 3, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Have you ever tried to uh, grow a garden? It's, it's hard. My wife tries every time. My wife, Amy, by the way, she's smiling. She knows how hard it is. She, I quit a long time ago. <laughs> but she never quits. She had a garden. And you know what? You leave it for two weeks. Guess what's in there? Grass. Uh, weeds. Undesirables. It's not easy to grow a garden, but to grow weeds, it's easy. Just leave them alone. It will go grow weeds. Then there's a curse on the vegetable kingdom. Genesis 3.18, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Then there's a curse on the human kingdom. Man was supposed to have dominion. He was supposed to be a, a, taking care of the whole thing. And God said, let us make man in our image, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 26, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. But man today did not, is not doing that. Why? Because of sin. Man is morally depraved. Just look around you. Man is morally depraved. We are celebrating the depravity of man today. You see on the news. What do you get there on the news? They're always talking about guns, guns, guns. We have to ban guns. You know, they did that in London. My hometown, London. <laughs> they banned all the guns in London. And pretty soon, they have a stabbing problem. And now, I, I kid you not, they banned all 
knives in public. Just check it out. Google it. Just like uh, what Rosie O'Donnell says. <laughs> Google it. They have a problem. Why? Because man is not it's not, uh, he has no dominion. He's morally depraved. Man's imagination is a garden of weeds. Man is also emotionally depraved. Adam's first words were in Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. He was afraid. Why? Because I was naked, I hid myself. I submit to you, he was afraid because he heard God's voice. He was afraid. People today try to discredit, deny, and dismiss the Bible. The truth is that they are afraid of the Word of God, what they might discover from it. God gave man a perfect garden and everything that you needed, and now you say, I'm afraid? Man is also spiritually deceased or dead. Romans 5.12 says this, Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You and I are dying. That's 100%. You are a terminal case, and so am I. We all have been uh, polluted by, the, by sin, by sin disease. And being saved does not make you immune. I feel angry when people on TV say, you receive Jesus Christ and everything is going to be blessing to you. Everything, you will be rich, you will be healthy, you will be famous. That's why Evander Holyfield, when he fought, uh, I think it's Mike Tyson, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Why? Because he believes he can beat Mike Tyson by putting that verse in there. That's the wrong use of the Word of God. He, built, uh, he beat Tyson because he's a very good boxer. I think he's the greatest, greatest of all time, better than Muhammad Ali. I'm sorry, Pastor. But we are cursed because of that sin. Now, before you get discouraged, watch this. And not only they, verse 23, Romans 8, 23. Let me read verse 22 first. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, or not only the heathen, not only the pagans, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Our bodies are not yet redeemed. Pastor always says, oh, believe it or not, this body as healthy and perfect as it is, is not yet redeemed. He always says that. I get a kick out of it. Because our body is not yet redeemed, our body is not free from pain and suffering. So again, the first simple point, yesterday's curse brings bondage. When Adam sinned, he brought all creation into corruption, and we, have all, we all have an infection called sin. Second point, I only have three, tomorrow's conquest brings liberty. Look with me, Romans 8, verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. The redemption of our body. Now, I'm all for conservation and ecology, being kind to animals, clean air. I like clean air, clean water. I'm all for that. And it's biblical. We are stewards of God's creation. 
But all efforts to save the world and love Mother Earth and combat global warming will fail. If you think you can save the world by fixing ecology, I have a job for you for rearranging the chairs of the Titanic. The golden age is going to come tomorrow, not today, not by man's efforts. The animal kingdom will be changed on that day. Isaiah 11, 6 to 9, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion, the fatling together and the little child shall lead them. That's the animal kingdom, it will be restored. The mineral kingdom will be changed. Isaiah 35, verse 1, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. The vegetable kingdom shall be changed. Isaiah 55, 13 says, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The human kingdom will be changed. Romans 8.23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. The Lord Jesus Christ will come to this earth, establish His kingdom. I am saved and just waiting for the redemption of the body. And so are you, if you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. We will have a glorified body just like what our Lord had. If you are not convinced, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven. That's our life. That's our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. This body is vile. We were walking a, a trail last night with uh, Brother Steve and our birthday... Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Sidebaka, Jan, and I can feel myself sweating, and my, my knees are hurting, and when I wake up this morning, my body is aching. Why? This body is vile. This body is passing away. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, that's Jesus Christ's glorious body, According to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Now we put a lot of work to take care of our body. But one day that's going to be done. It's going to be done away with. Jesus is going to turn every tear into a pearl. Every hurt into a hallelujah. Every defeat into a victory. And every calvary into an Easter. That's when Jesus comes. It is today, number three, last, last point, it is today's comfort that brings up. Look with me in Romans chapter 8, verse 24. For we are saved by hope. Don't miss this, please. For we are, are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Hope is something that you don't have in your hand, but you know it's yours. I have some money, a little bit, I don't want to say too much. I have some money, well, not in the bank, but in my pocket. Okay? Okay, it's in the bank, otherwise the, the, the illustration would be bust. It's in the bank. I, th I think I have... $20 in the bank. I know it's mine, but it's not with me. I can't see it. But I know it's in the bank. Hope is something that you don't have in your hand, but you know it's yours. Therefore, if we have this hope, we understand that the pain and suffering we endure are temporary. 
I put my hope in the blessed hope. I put my trust in the blessed hope, I should say. Why? That blessed hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see three times Paul uses the word uh, groan. One is in uh, 8.22, the groaning of creation. The whole creation groan is travailed in pain together until now. Everything is winding down. Everything is decaying and coming apart. And then there's the groaning of the Christian. And not only they, but ourselves also, we groan. Whole creation groans. The Christian also groan. And then the groaning of the comforter. I've been to the hospital many times and see faithful saints suffer. And I'm reminded of one uh, friend of mine, a doctor in our old church in his 20s, late 20s. He just graduated to become a doctor. He's going to practice the next year. And then he came to the States, probably visited Disneyland and all those things. When he came back, he went to the doctor because of pain on his uh, hip. 29 years old, probably 28. They discovered that he has a cancer of the bone marrow. There's almost no cure for that, right, Brad Donnie? The bone marrow? Because that's where all the, uh, the blood is coming from. And he, the doctor gave him three months to live. I came to the hospital, and I'm with another pastor, Pastor Ruben and Pastor Ben. And he was lying there, helpless. A doctor who spent at least 10 years to be a doctor. And when he's about to reap the rewards of his labor, there goes cancer. He's in pain. And he's groaning. What do I do? Ask God, why did it happen to him, God? No. I didn't ask anything, but just like Paul, pastor, the pastor told me, we reckon that the sufferings of this present time, they're going to be suffering. But thank God, there's a groaning of the comforter. Look in verse 26, 826. Likewise, in the same way, the whole creation suffers and the whole uh, Christians, the saints of God, the choice saints of God suffer. Everything suffers in this world. Likewise, the Spirit. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For, ne for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And that's especially painful. Thank God we serve a Spirit who groans with us. Thank God we serve a God with tears in His eyes. We serve a God who cares and says, Cast all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. We are Savior that invites you to come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. The pain you suffer if you are a Christian is but temporary. It's not going to last, brother. I've been suffering 20 years. Brother, praise the Lord. It's not going to last. It's, it just changes your perspective, right? This side of the grave, suffering is temporary. Conversely, if you are not saved, on the other hand, if you are not saved... All of the joy you'll ever know in this side is in this side of the grave. If you are not a Christian, all the joy and happiness that you can ever experience 
is before you die. But if you're a Christian, all the sorrow, suffering, pain, and death you will experience is in this life. Christian, the pain you endure is temporary, but the glory that you will have is eternal. We are prepared for glory. When pain comes, when suffering comes, the Bible says this, the spirit self bear it witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, if you don't know if you belong to God, you don't have his spirit. If you don't, if you, if you don't have the spirit, you do not belong to God. Now, if you don't know if you belong to God, friend, you are going to suffer anyway. Just like uh, Pastor Needy would, would say. When, when asked, how are you, brother? I'm feeling fine. I'm feeling good. And he would reply, that's just a temporary situation. All, all of us are going to suffer, saved or lost. And let, let me close with this. Romans chapter 8, verse 33 to 44. Romans chapter 8, verse 33 to 44. I love this verse. This is for the Christian. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I'm always, as I've said, I'm always nervous when pastor asks me to preach. I feel inadequate. But friend, I have a living Savior praying for me this morning as I preach this sermon. I get the comfort in that. No fault can condemn us. condemn us. No foe can conquer us. And no fear need control us. Verse 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul knew suffering, but he was doing some reckoning you have a choice God gave you a choice like he gave Adam a choice and there's no reason why you should be in hell while all of these things are going on there's no reason you should miss heaven because Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died for you the last Adam that's Jesus has undone what the first Adam did. You have a choice. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you are not sure you are saved, by the authority of the word of God, he will save you if you ask him today. Now I'm not talking about joining Pioneer Baptist Church. I'm talking about receiving salvation, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. He will save you. I remember when I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I prayed something like this. Lord Jesus, I'm not looking for a sign. I'm not looking for a feeling. I just want to ask you to forgive me of all my sins, for all my sins. All the bad choices I made and all the times I took you for granted, I now repent and ask you to cleanse me of my filthiness and save me. I know that you are a God. That's my prayer. I know you are a God and the Bible is your word. I cannot save myself, but you can. Just like that publican in the temple, he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, please take control of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Is that your prayer? Is that, about, is that uh, what you feel about this whole thing? Is that the desire of your heart? There was going to be an invitation time. Now, sometimes uh, we sing, and we, we, we definitely sing, and we 
Sometimes we have an invitation, a call, an altar call we call it. And it's that, that's for you to have a, if you're not saved, that's for you to get, get a chance to say, Lord, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed that I am a sinner. I am not ashamed that I cannot save myself. I am not ashamed that you sent your son coming down from heaven, becoming a man, to die on the cross for my sins. I am not ashamed to be identified with that. I am not ashamed to be called a Christian. I want to, I want to show people, I want to show the congregation, I want to show God that I am not ashamed. You are saying, Lord, I am yours. I am not afraid to tell people that I trusted today the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord, I pray during this time of invitation that you give the courage that girl, boy, young person, or maybe those older people, to give them the courage to come and show that they're not ashamed of you. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that he died, he was buried, and rose again from the dead the third day, according to the Bible. And Lord, bless this invitation time. We'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.